Let's try unmuting myself first. Um, thank you all for attending the Risk Modeling Advisory Workgroup being held on July 26, 2023 at 1 p.m. I will now open this meeting with some information for the workgroup. The Risk Modeling Advisory Workgroup will be following the open meeting requirements of Bagley Keene. If you would like to speak, please raise your hand. Members of the public can comment on an agenda following member discussion, but we ask that you limit your time. For items not on the agenda, the public will have an opportunity to address the group, but you are asked to limit your comments to three minutes. If you are filling in for a committee member, please answer for the person you are filling in for and state your first and last name. I will now take roll call. Jim McDougall. Here. Carlos Camarina. Deborah Hobblestadt. Here. Neil Matuka. Paul Glushku. Max Mortiz. Nancy Watkins. I see Nancy. She's just not unmuted. Dave Winokur. Here. Robert Marshall. I'm here. Thank you. Anthony Powers. Yana Valachovic. Good afternoon. Chris Ochoa. This is Nick Camerata filling in for Chris. Thank you, Nick. Dory Beats. Dory, I also saw you there too. There you are. Your mic's not working, Dory. Oh, there you are. Terry Woodrow. Joe Irvin. Here. Melissa Semser. Here. Quorum is nine people, 50 plus one quorum is established. I will now move on to agenda review. And Jim, that's for you. Hey, thank you, Celeste. Um, oh, not sure what that is. <laughs> but, um, okay, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Nick Cameron. Uh, Nick. OK, thank mm -hmm. you, Nick. Uh, is there a second? Second. Deborah. Second, Robert Marshall. We got Deborah. Thanks, so Robert. OK, is there any discussion around the agenda? OK, seeing no hands. All those in favor of uh, approving the agenda? Uh, aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Any opposed? All right. Uh, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion to approve the past meeting uh, meeting minutes? I'll move, Melissa Sensor. Melissa, thank you. Is there a second? Robert Marshall second. Got Robert, it this time. You. Yeah, you did. Yes, you did. All right. Uh, there's been a motion with the first and second. Is there any discussion discussion around the past meeting minutes? All right. Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any sure can aye. Do whoever that is. I'm not sure. Yeah, I it can't is. figure out who it I'm, is. I'm working on it. Yeah. Dory, I think your mic is having some problems right now. 
Okay. Uh, was there any opposed? Okay. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right. Um, so, Celeste, if you want to bring the document up, uh, Dave, I think we were at a place um, quite a ways down in the document. Um, I think the group wanted to finish up those major items. I know there was a bunch of edits and work done in there uh, by folks this week, so thank you very much. Um, but I think we wanted to get those other big items uh, discussed and off the table so we can then go back and do some of the cleanup that Dave Yana and some folks did some, some a lot of cleanup in there. Um, I don't know if folks got a chance to review that or not, um, but uh, things are looking really good. I think uh, we get these other big topics out of the way. Um, further down, I think, Celeste. Yeah, I think this is where we are. So up a little bit. Dave, are you there? I am. Thanks, sure I'm off mute. OK, there we go. Yeah, Jim, I'm I'm traveling down to a uh, presentation and, and okay. not well positioned to, to drive the conversation today. Thank you. Understood. Yeah, I think uh, the one section we were at last week. Uh, let's see here. Uh, go, go back up a little bit. So last, let me pull the document myself. Um, so the lessons learned from other state perils uh, had been removed. Uh, Nancy put a comment on there. Uh, we do have in the outline. Um, this is just a bigger conversation, right? Not specific to the words in it. Uh, we do have in the outline uh, discussion lessons learned from other states and perils. Um, Deborah, I've seen a lot of your comments in there, and yes, that language was from the original version. I did not have anything edited, but the main discussion is for the group um, to keeping that section in there about lessons learned from other states and perils. So with that, I'll open it up for discussion. Okay, so seeing no discussion, since the group did approve uh, in the outline to have this in there, um, I don't see anybody wanting to remove it back out or intended for it to completely be removed back out. Um, it's mostly just a discussion and uh, we can have uh, let Deborah talk about it a little bit because um, she has a big comment in there. Deborah, I don't disagree necessarily with your comments completely. Um, this is just, you know, what's happened in the past, just explanation, but if, um, I will turn it over to you because it, with your comment in there, though, for discussion. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, so I do have a lengthy comment in there that um, I don't need to kind of recite. I think everyone can can read it, but um, and I, I didn't want to comment just now because I was trying to leave it open for other folks to to jump in. Um, I I would like to hear other perspectives on why we would include um, something like earthquake or or flood. I think that those perils are quite distinct from fire. I mean, when you're thinking about um, race and bolts or you're thinking about uh, retrofitting your home for flood, um, those kinds of retrofits are going to affect your home directly. Um, and when you have, um, the, you know, when you're looking at fire, you need to really be thinking about both the community and your own parcel. So I'm I'm not 100% sure that um, that these are analogous types of perils that that should be included as um, uh, you know inform. I mean, they, I'm sure they could be informative, but they're also not. Wildfire is not um, infrequent. You know, see, when you have earthquake, the reason that California allows cap modeling for earthquake is because it's so infrequent, we don't have historical data. And I think with um, with fire, certainly climate change is creating new conditions and new uh, um, a new paradigm where we have more and more severe and, and different kinds of fire. Um, but I also think that there is value in the historical record. 
Um, so those are sort of just on the 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 substance of like whether we want to include um, earthquake and flood and the experiences in other states. I think the language that's included here, if we do opt to go f to include um, discussion of other perils in other states, I think um, we would need to dramatically rewrite this. Thanks, Deborah. Uh, Robert, I see you're next. Yeah, I uh, I understand the piece about earthquake specifically, and maybe that one shouldn't be included. I guess I could go either way on that. Uh, flooding, though, I actually see a lot of a lot of uh, parallels there um, with flooding. Um, you know, I mean, earlier this year we had a rainstorm that came in and dumped, you know, pretty much an annual rainfall in about a, you know, 36 hour period. And that is climate change related. And it is absolutely related to the wildfire risk uh, because of the fuels uh, and the increase in fuels and that kind of stuff. But then also just the uh, knowing that models are kind of measure the same kinds of things and particularly in an area like mine where we don't have a lot of history on the wildfire problem um, but because of climate change and because of things like, like big rain events that uh, change the kind of rain that we get where we get the rain uh, you know potential earth flow uh, and all, all the things that go along with that I do actually think that there is some value in it uh, to include it, particularly for flood. If, if everybody thinks that maybe earthquake is a bridge too far, then yeah, maybe. But um, but I do see some value for at least local governments who are going to be reading this to know that some of these kinds of models apply to other things that we have, uh, because it just helps us to understand the whole modeling process better. OK, thank you, sir. Um, Dave. Deborah, I just had a, a question, clarification, and, and perhaps you know, certainly informative for me. But you mentioned that we don't have historical data for earthquake. Uh, I'm, I'm sure what you meant is we don't have a lot of historical data for earthquake. But to, to build on Robert's point, at least in the East Bay, the frequency of earthquake and the frequency of destructive fires, earthquake being 1906, 1989, destructive fires being 1923, 1991, is actually very similar. And it would be helpful, at least from my perspective, to have a better understanding of what the breakover point is on frequency of events, where histor as in earthquake, where historical data is insufficient. And, and what's the frequency where, where that we start to transition to a space where where you would consider the frequency to be sufficient for historical data to be relevant. Yeah, I so I don't have a specific answer to that. This is this is a discussion that's ongoing within the department um, in terms of the use of cat modeling. We just hosted a, a public hearing two weeks ago on this topic. It's something that our actuaries are looking at. It's something that our uh, rate regulation folks are looking at. So I, I can't speak to, you know, what the what the lines would be. It's just historic, like, you know, as included in Prop 103 and sort of the, the regulations that we uh, enforce, um, earthquake was exempted from uh, from the requirements to use historical modeling because there was this understanding that they happened infrequently enough to not have a record. So I mean I can't I can't give you a specific answer. I think it's a good question um, and one that is worthy of further discussion. I just don't know that this document is the place to have that discussion. But I also would be fine. I mean I, I think that um, that Robert's comments are, are well taken. Like, you know, if we want to talk about climate risks versus all perils, right? So then if we excluded earthquake because that's not directly linked to climate, but we wanted to include some kind of analogy to flood, um, you know, I'm not I'm not totally opposed to that. I just think then the language here with um, Florida hurricane, um, it I <laughs> I don't think that they have a stable market right now. So I think that there's there's a lot that we need revamping um, 
in in the discussion of Florida hurricane. Thanks, um, Nick. Yeah, I just wanted to um, chime in with what has already been said, but to add maybe two relatively minor points: how how flood is like um, wildfire in in, <clears throat> in this sense. You don't just um, flood proof a house. Uh, you also there are also community um, measures that protect the entire community. I'm thinking in particular, uh, for example, of the Natomas Basin here in Sacramento, where we've spent um, an awful lot of money and and years improving the levees uh, through federal, state, and local funding in order to provide. Um, <clears throat> significant protection to the I don't know now whether it's almost 100,000 folks who live in the Natomas Basin. Um, so it's it's like a wildfire in that respect as well in, you know, you can elevate an individual home and, and or in combination with uh, levy improvements to provide flood protection in. And there you do have some um, some historical data, at least enough to where we have established in law a 100 year level of flood protection and a 200 year level of flood protection, at least here in the state of California. So um, I know uh, I just wanted to add my my two cents worth on that. So yeah. that was it. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Nancy. Um, thanks uh, for recognizing me and my apologies. I've been trying to get on the Wi-Fi for 15 minutes, so I missed the first part of this. I do see what section we're on, um, and I've just on the the lessons learned from other states and perils is not that we can we can take an earthquake model and make it into a wildfire model, or hurricane data and wildfire data are the same. This was about how count models have been used to promote mitigation. Only that. And um, the reason for California earthquake being in there is to basically give a California specific example of, um, you know, a sophisticated agency that is doing modeling to understand the benefits of earthquake building retrofits. And that, that agency was the CEA. The Florida example was to talk about building codes and um, promotion of, of home hardening um, grants funded by the state to harden homes and how the state had even put in um, a, 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 an entity to understand catastrophe models and to evaluate them um, for various purposes. The, the purpose of flood was, was really um, more of an insurance purpose, but in California, I think there is kind of a crossover purpose. And I think as uh, I think Nick might've mentioned, there's a lot of um, ways that flood models are being used to understand the effects of sea level rise and to the uh, understand the effects of flood mitigation. The purpose of putting in the NAIC actions is just to say that the NAIC is paying attention to models and using them for other purposes so that the reader can understand, you know, how how one body of the of um, our, our regulatory uh, framework has been dealing with catastrophe models outside of California to give more context. Um, I tried to stay away from pricing for the most part. I definitely, uh, to Deborah's point, could uh, could could take out even more, and we could put in more about what FEMA is doing on modeling. Dave picked up a good site on that, but. I do, I do want to point out that there's not a lot of lessons learned from wildfire model mitigation in other states that's widespread, and that's why looking to other perils and, and other domains actually is instructive, in my opinion. Okay, Nancy, thank you. Uh, Yana? Uh, thank you. Great, great comments, great suggestions. Um, you know, Deborah, I love the the framing you have around like, let's really stick to our points and be succinct and, and not wander and deviate. Um, when I read this document, it goes in and out of sections that seem a little wonky and hard to understand for an average person. And then sections that like seem really intuitive and easy to understand. I have to say from just a purely objective user 
viewpoint. I think the piece on the California earthquakes and flood and Florida hurricanes offers some useful information and it's very accessible to people. And I get a lot of comments. People ask, like, how do other folks do, how other states address these issues? And I think it gives us a little um, background. And when we do the background on the models and the modeling approach, and so I kind of like the background here because it it gives us some sense of where we sit in the spectrum of issues. And I think it makes the report more readable as a, as a result for that. Maybe there needs to be a little more tweak on the front end as to why we're bringing them forward. Um, and there's certainly a lot more around, you know, where we came from building response respective to earthquakes and how that's informed, you know, some of our actions within California. That's maybe a little bit too wandering, but, um, I think I lean towards liking it just for the readability and contextualization of the issues we're working on. Thank you very much. Sorry to have my phone muted there. Um, Deborah. I can wait until after the next person's comment. I just, yeah. Um, you are the last one with your hand up at this point. All right. Well, <laughs> yeah, so I think actually this all makes a fair amount of sense. And um, I think that, um, you know, our my, my primary concern is language relating to the pricing, using the modeling for pricing, using the modeling for, you know, insurance industry stability and insurance industry solvency and things like that. I, I, I continue to think that that is outside the scope of this document where we have experts on wildfire and risks associated with uh, physical risks associated with wildfires. Um, but I think I, I hear what everyone is saying in terms of the analogies one can make with flood um, and, um, you know, the need to discuss existing model options out there. And so I think if we could shrink this down significantly, because it does seem like pretty outsized in terms of the the length of discussion in here, especially when you look at what we're required to do from the legislation. I mean, there's, there's a section in the legislation that asks us to consider nature-based solutions. And I think we have three sentences on nature-based solutions, and it does not ask us to look at perils outside of the state or outside of wildfire and we have like three pages so i think shrinking this down and um and tightening it up and taking out references to modeling for pricing and modeling for insurance solvency and all that we could and explaining i think i mean nancy made some really good points about why this language was included here i think sort of explaining at the front why are we including a section on other perils and other states and then going through very briefly um, and, and highlighting the most salient pieces um, and, and excising the language about uh, insurance pricing, we could probably get to a, a reasonable place. Hey, I don't see anybody else's hand up. So I think the group has agreed to leave this in. Um, I know, Nancy, you and I have chatted back and forth. I know you um, said you had some other language we could edit on this, so maybe we can work with that and uh, do some edits and bring it back to the group. Um, but we will leave yeah. that in. So that, thank you, Nancy. And that, so that's a big one to get past here. So we will leave that in. Um, Celeste, if you want to go down to uh, what other section here? Um, I think it's on page 43. Okay, Nancy, this is the section you had a question about. We added it back in for discussion group, and I don't know you said you can't necessarily see the screen. Um, it would be the one about uh, actuarial guidance to assess model strength and weakness. Yeah, yeah, and and I I can actually see the screen right now. Okay. I, I was trying to type. I'm okay with Deborah's su suggestion. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm catching up to you. Yeah. Um. This uh paragraph, I think, it, it's in a place where uh it's about limitations of cat models and how um it, it, it's it's hard. It it was um it was yeah. a. The, the follow on after saying it's hard to correctly understand and interpret results. And there, 
what the purpose of the paragraph is to talk about, and, and really, this is not necessarily focused at insurance pricing. So I, I just want to say that up front. Um, actuaries do a lot of different things. Pricing is one of them. Um, but and, and insurance and industry experts who use cap models do a lot of things. We have developed guidance um, for understanding catastrophe models. And I think the part of the, about the NAIC guidance from the last um, section that we just were talking about might go better here to put together a little section on like, yes, cap models are hard to understand. And here are some resources to help understand them. And I, I do believe that that has relevance to this whole discussion because you, even if you you know you want to use a model for mitigation, if you don't understand how to use a model or how to evaluate whether a model is useful for mitigation, you might be disappointed or confused or, or even misuse the results. Okay, so you're recommending move maybe replacing that with the NAIC piece up that we just discussed? Sorry, to, to put the paragraph back and then move that NAIC piece here to talk about like, and, and I think we can get rid of the risk-based capital reference because um, that's now we're going to be a non sequitur when, when we move this here. But um, it, it, like, where do you get training on cap models? Um, there's there's some standards here from um, actuarial uh, bodies, and then the NAIC has some training as well. So I, I think when I looked at this, I thought maybe it would make a little bit more sense to the reader if we put those two things together. So another paragraph that came out of the uh, the prior section of lessons learned from other states and perils. Okay. Um, any other comments? Okay. Oh, Deborah? Yep, yeah, thanks. I, I think, it, I'm trying to go back and forth here. Um, so, so we do have a section seven right now is labeled limitations of models more generally, not just limitations of cat models. Um, and so I think, um, I mean, I think what Nancy said makes sense here. I'm just trying to think through, I, you know, I can't really comment until I see the other paragraph, but it just, um, there we may want a little clarification of what we're you know what we're talking about as far as the types of models and their various limitations and then i also would say um you know in the paragraph that's highlighted um i mean i don't have any doubt that the protocols are rigorous or anything but i think we want to be careful of um sort of language that implies judgment that that several of us may not have sufficient knowledge to back up right like i i, I just think we want to be careful to not have a lot of uh, colorful language in the document if we're talking about somebody else and how they're working and what they're doing well uh, can you give an example of what you mean by colorful um so okay so i mean i think there there are a lot of just conclusory statements here like there are many actuaries and experts in the insurance industry who are familiar with cap models okay i'm going to assume that that's true um they've developed rigorous protocols so i'm we need to know their protocols to see if they're rigorous um and are they testing uh, the reasonableness consistency and reliability of results um there is extensive guidance on this i mean it's it's I don't have huge objections. I'm just saying, um, uh, I, I think it's probably I'm most, I'm most responding to the rigorous, but I don't have a major concern, but maybe we can just take out rigorous or, I don't know, um, it, just so that it's not, if, if it depends on who's looked at these protocols. And if everyone in the group can be like, yeah, these are rigorous protocols, we can totally stand by that, then that's great. But if we haven't as a group looked at these and don't aren't familiar with them, then do we want to be saying, do we want to be policing judgment around what those protocols are? So if, if are, are we applying those kinds of standards to things that like other 
parts of the document? I mean, I thought we were a, a, a multidisciplinary group because different people have different skill sets. I haven't seen other places in the document where we talk about um, what someone outside of the the working group is doing and sort of placing value judgments on them. But if we do, I think that would be a, something we can think about. Right. Okay, I, 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 I don't really want to get into that, but um, yeah, we'll work on it. If we wanted to, if we wanted to get rid of the word rigorous, I don't think the whole thing suffers. Um, I, I, the, the point is, you don't just have to believe a cat model. I, and I think that if we're trying to educate the public on cap models or, or models, like this section used to be about cap models and then someone got rid of the word cat catastrophe as, as a sort of compromise. So it, it, it was really around that. There's lots and lots of different kinds of models. Um, the, a 20 year uh, average of historical results is a model. Um, so I, I think if we're, trying to generalize every kind of wildfire model and put that in there as well, then some of the statements have to be rethought of. Um, so if we're, if, we're, if we're in the context around uh, sophisticated risk models, um, then this actually does apply. And uh, I, I do think it's important just for context to, to let people know that there's ways to test models um, and that there's there are some standards and educational uh, places to go um, if, if they want to learn more, especially when we're talking about new use cases um, for mitigation for wildfire, where maybe a community, all these users of the report that we're talking about, most of them are not in the insurance industry. So I thought to know where to go for for training and standards is a useful thing, in my opinion. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Nancy, we'll work on this one. We'll look at bringing that other paragraph down and combining things here um, and bring that back to the next group or the group next time. Excuse me. Is there any other comments or thoughts on this from anybody else? Let's go down to eight two. I think that's the next one. So Yana, you had a comment here that we didn't get to last time. Ooh. Yana, did we lose you? You didn't get off mute. I'm not going to speak for Yana. This is Melissa, but I, I think there's okay. probably a way. I just think there's probably a way to temper this language a little bit that yeah. it makes it less, you know, struggle yeah. to find consistent answers. I think there's a, a way to just play with the sentences. Yeah. That okay. I, I don't know if it's beyond for concerns beyond that, but yeah, I know she had made a bunch of. Well, if we get back up to them today, where she, you know, made a bunch of the language easier for folks to read, maybe that don't understand as much as this group does. So I think that's just another one of those places to to work on to your point there. Yep, I agree. OK. Um, do you want me to jump in? Absolutely. OK. So this is this is just a holder, a placeholder. Um, when Dave and um, Deborah and I were working on it, um, the three of us together, one of the legislative mandates is to discuss cost effective ways to gather data. Um, and it wasn't clear that we had done that. So it was just a holding place. Um, so it's not really my specific comment, but wondering if there is a way to weave into the data availability and consistency. Um, a conversation about this. I'm not sure if any of us in this group have expertise around this area, 
about how to gather data in cost effective ways. I certainly don't. Um, but it just noting that it was part of the mandate. Yeah. Uh, Dave, your hands up. Uh, yeah, I just I would editorialize a little bit, having done a lot of this at the micro scale and, and that <laughs> cost effective requires context and, and it needs to be relative to something else. And all of this stuff is a compromise and we're seeing this unfold with various and sundry purveyors of, of various data and, and insights, um, uh, satellite or construction date or, or you know things that can be used as a surrogate for actual conditions on the ground all of which are, are really problematic at, at the tippy point of the spear that i think most of us are focused on which is how do we use um, modeling to value mitigations and not necessarily value relative to insurance but value via the the fema concept of aala average annual loss avoidance how do we how do we value these and then how do they get value requires being credited credited requires accurate and verifiable data and that is not coming from a satellite or from general information such as uh, parcel size building location on a parcel and construction date which is what a lot of the the commercial solutions are offering right now simply because collecting data on the ground with verification and annual return is uh, is very expensive to collect and is very expensive to organize. And so I just I, I would offer that up to say that this one feels to me like it, it it would be I would personally be very comfortable with punting with a response that that really speaks to how the need for data explains why the, the various uh, components of data need to be uh, with collected with appropriate rigor and verification and return interval and then finishes off with and and this is <laughs> this is very this can be very expensive because it is yeah and we did discuss it i was trying to look back up to the document um when i was looking through it earlier we did discuss some of that up in the very beginning i think to your point melissa um trying to find it here real quick um where we did mention cost effective. Um, find it here. Yana, are you back on? OK, uh, it is mentioned um, up in the executive summary about, the, about discussion of having a value, having a high quality cost effective data to support just everything Dave just said. Um, so Dave, maybe to your point, maybe we add something in here a little bit about that because we all know it's challenging. It's not going to be cheap, um, really, any way you do it. And the fact of the matter is, to be honest, it is expensive, right? Um, and it's very, very time consuming. So um, maybe we can just add a piece in there about that. Does that yeah, I'll, work I'll, for you? I'll take that for action. Okay. Melissa, that help. I think you're right, though, because we do mention it up in the executive summary. Um, but we don't really talk about it very deeply down here in the in the barriers part. That's fine with me. Like I said, it wasn't wasn't my comment. Just hold yeah. over from our conversation. OK, no, I think it's good, though. Because we've been trying to make sure that what we get in the executive summary is discussed further down in the document. So that's a really good catch. So. Awesome. OK. Where are we now, Celeste? Um, Deborah, this is your comment, I believe. Um, so these are actually not my comments. These were just carried over when when Dave, Melissa, and I were doing the work on whatever it was, June 26. I was just trying to copy over 
the concerns that other people had raised. So Yana had asked a couple of questions. I'd have to, I can't really see it here. I'm unclear on the intent of the sentence. And then Elia had said that um, maybe we can reduce confusion. I mean, I literally copied their comments, so I don't know. Um, confusion can be further reduced by coupling this with guidance for how, when, and why to use certain models over others. So it was just, um, these were comments that people made on the original draft, and I'm not sure where they stand at this point. Okay. All right. So Jim, the Celeste here. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So it looks like we did reach out to Clay from OPR. Is that the right one? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And he did go in and add some sentences here to clean up confusion. So Aaliyah, who was from OPR, um, said, and then um, he came in and cleaned this up. So there are some added stuff in there. So I think that we can probably go ahead and accept those comments and that and anything from Aaliyah who came from OPR has been resolved at this point. OK, great. Thank you, um, Nancy. Um, thanks. I'm 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 hoping I'm following the comments. OK, uh, it looks like there's a question about why. What, what does that sentence mean um, about wildfire risk models starting with different data and coming up with different co conclusions? And then there's some a comment about climate scenarios. Those are apples and oranges. So if, if one is supposed to relate to the other, I, I don't think that it has any relationship to each other. What, what we're talking about, and, and definitely if this group is confused, then that probably means that somebody else is going to be confused as well. What we're saying is if models don't understand the current conditions and mitigation is a very, the, the current state of vegetation and, and mitigation is, um, is an important current com condition. If they don't understand it widely within a community, then there's gonna be a lot of variation just introduced by them guessing at what the current conditions are. Um, that's actual data, not some sort of climate scenarios. Um, now, and, and then that sentence is going to say, even if you resolve that confusion and you give them all the same data on current conditions, they're still going to come up with different answers about what, what risk might be, but you reduce a lot of dissonance between models by bringing them better data at, that's common in the first place. The California Climate Assessment's projection and scenarios work just, I don't know very much about it, but it can't possibly be what we're talking about here, like property yeah. level mitigation, uh, inspections, all aggregated up and available to modelers. Like that's that's a forward looking climate scenario thing, which is important and useful. It just doesn't belong as the answer to this paragraph. Okay. Any other comments here? We're going to obviously have to clean this up a little bit. But thank you, Celeste, for clarifying the comments that were in the document of, that we can remove all those they've been gone over. Yeah, it, I think it's more confusing for me personally. Um, so I was trying to understand it earlier today. Um, so um, we can work on that. Yana, are you back on or? I think we've completely lost Yana. No, she's Yana. muted right now. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, there you are. We've been sorry. looking for you. Maybe you're on another. Sorry, I got, I got one of those crazy calls there. But yeah, I think one I thing, one thing to keep in mind on the climate space is just like the pixel scale issue is just so broad brush. I mean, most of the climate prediction models, the pixel size is about the size of Humboldt County. Yeah. Right, and so getting into accurate predictions <laughs> gets a little fuzzy. So, you know, there's we just got to temper expectations a bit. We're just not there yet. Okay, so we need to work on this one. Uh, you had a comment in here too on this one, Yana. So um, we need to look at this paragraph specifically. Okay. Um. You have the notes there, Celeste. Okay.
Okay. Moving down. All those are, yeah. And, uh, right, Celeste? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So okay. they did go in and clean a bunch of the, or put in comments where they had it. So they are where they wanted to clean okay. some stuff up. Okay. So we can just resolve all those then. Okay, Melissa. Yes. Um, so this is one I, I would appreciate help with, honestly. This was just my stab at um, a couple of different things. Um, and maybe they don't belong together. Um, but you know, I, I think that we've talked about multiple times the locational impact of mitigations. Um, and I'm not sure from a risk modeling perspective, we understand that. So um, I, I felt like that was alluded to throughout the paper or mentioned different places, but not mentioned here that we would have to, we would have to, a risk model would have to be able to understand this and to be able to model this. So, um, so I took a stab at putting some language in. Um, and then, of course, I tried to also weave in about the utility aspect of that as well, because that also has a locational impact of whether the utilities are hardened or not. Um, uh, you know, again, if you do a mitigation at your own home, but the utilities surrounding you are not mitigated, um, it, you may not be able to, it may not have the same same value. Um, and then, as you can see, I went to the recommendation and I trailed off because I didn't really know what to say. Um, so this was a, a, a meant to be a, a group edit as, as a starting place, but um, I guess the conversation would start with, is this a worthwhile conversation to have in here? Um, and then if so, I would ask for help to help um, build the section out. Hey, uh, Nancy, your hand, what's up? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I definitely think it's a worthwhile topic, um, and I'm glad Melissa's on the group because, you know, when 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 people like, a, a lot of times people like me think about mitigation, we're thinking about things like home mitigation and vegetation, and we're not thinking about reducing the, the, the start of the fire, which is a kind of mitigation she thinks about. So I'm okay with including it. I am very, very queasy about using words like must be included. Like you you, you, you definitely, yeah. I think, would want to soften some of those lang some of the language, like just to, to understand that some models are not going to be about that. And if you want to understand risk, you know, of one thing, you might not need to include toggles that, that have mitigations built in for ignitions or or even locations of power lines like they're, it, they're just not all going to be this, the same uh, level of granularity and, and, and purpose. So I, I'd say if you could soften that, um, then it, I'd be um, I, I would think it would be informative to add this in. I have hey, no objection to softening that. Dave, you have a comment? Here as well. So I was just going to say, I, I, as I, I know we've talked about this before, but if we're going to include ignition reduction as a mitigation, uh, I think there's a there are numerous and uh, other initiatives, elements, things that we're going to need to consider. Uh, and at least from my perspective, ignition reduction is not a mitigation in a fire prone slash fire dependent landscape. Yeah, we discussed that last week too. Um, okay. Folks need a minute to look at it. Um, Yanni, you're so good with words. I figured you're going to have something to say here. <laughs> You know, Nancy, you raise an interesting point about the should, would, um, 
kind of comment. I guess I've been thinking about like there is value in understanding. There's value in like the instead of should using there is value or would benefit from or some consideration of as a way to try and soften but still make the point. Does that kind of language work for you? It, 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 it's moving in that direction. Um, it, I guess I'd say models are going to be different. Like there might be value um, in considering it within any given model or there might not. <laughs> right, right. So, so it, it's just, you know, I guess the, the if you step back from the point, um, we have a whole section on mitigations that matter. Like what what are the mitigations that matter? And now we've heard Chief Winokur say he doesn't consider this to be mitigation. It, 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 we might be in a, a terminology like dissonance, depending on where you are, which world you come from. I, I don't have independent knowledge or opinions about that. But I would say that what we're, what we're trying to get at is how do you measure risk if something's changing, like uh, infrastructure hardening, you know, Models can be used to model the impact of that change. And so, like when you're looking at a model, you might want to ask, is this in, in the model or not? Like, and, and consider the effect of, uh, if it were included, would it change the results? That's, that's the kind of, you know, general mm -hmm. statement that might work. Um, but what we tried to do is, is, is to lay out what we meant by mitigations earlier in the paper and then talk about modeling those the risk including those mitigations and so putting this here as a barrier or a recommendation i'm not sure if it's if it's fitting in the right it doesn't mean i don't want to talk about it i'm not sure if this is the right place to do it i can't tell you if it is or not Yeah, this is Melissa again. I mean, I, I feel similarly. Like I said, I was just trying to maybe start the conversation so we could talk about where this would go. I do think, um, you know, I, I, Dave and I think we've come to more understanding of where the other one is coming from. I, I do think we do have a slight difference of um, of worlds that we come from and understanding in terms of the mitigations, um, because I get that once the fire is there the fire is there it's almost irrelevant how it started how and and i also get that it's a fire adapted landscape and so you could argue that regardless of what starts the fire if it starts perhaps perhaps that's a a useful thing for the landscape and i don't disagree with that um i do think that as far as anthropogenic wildfires or fires are concerned this is obviously a source that seems to cause ex very catastrophic ones when it does happen, um, in part because of the volume of spark that is being fed and the, con and the continuation of that that source uh, being there. Um, and you know, that you could argue that a community would not necessarily be as uh, subjected to a wildfire if it were not for this very key high risk source of potential ignitions that's there. So that's, I think that's kind of always where I'm going to stand. And I, I get that maybe Dave and I are not going to ever come together on this, but, um, but I think, you know, we'd be remiss to not understand that the presence of the utility asset causes higher risk in and of itself um, for the community to burn. And then yes, it does help you know, to harden to harden the community if it were to catch on fire, but there is something to be said for not increasing your risk of it catching on fire for a reason that's wholly unnatural um, and significant. Um, that being said, I also agree that I'm not totally sure it belongs here. I'm not sure where it belongs, um, but I keep coming back to like this is a key area. Maybe it's a, a risk factor. I mean, is there a place to just carve it out as a risk factor and just say that, like, uh, unusually wildfires are often human caused and this is one of the main cause? Um, 
causes. One of, the more one of the more catastrophic causes. I wouldn't say it's one of the main causes, but it's one yeah. of the more catastrophic causes. Right, right. Yeah, and, and perhaps that is where it needs to go is just an understanding, you know, of risk. Again, it's like I think about if, a, if we're building a comprehensive risk model, part of what we need to understand is what are our key risks and then how do we mitigate against them? And, and I think the point is respective to other human ignitions like dragging a chain or escape campfire or a cigarette, but those don't consistently happen when we have a high wind event. And the utility issue is when we have extreme wildfire conditions. Exactly. Right. So there's a convergence of weather and ignition that is very unique to that specific issue where the other human ignitions are during a whole spectrum of, of weather events. So I think it kind of, I mean, I'm with you, Melissa. I think it deserves some attention and some framing because it is in this, it's in its own category because of that issue. And and it, why wouldn't a community get some, some bonus points if a utility had been undergrounded or the, um, the hazards to those utility lines had been super addressed in some way? Like, it seems like that's got to have some, some power in, in addressing the fundamental challenges that we face with delivering electricity in a cost-effective and um, supportive way across all of California. Yeah. Hey, Joe? Yeah, thanks. You guys know I don't say a ton, but when I do, I want to double down on what Yana just said. I think that it needs to be mentioned because that mitigating that risk to uh, electrify and power communities is a big issue and there should be some points um, that help communities um, remain competitive in the marketplace and safe and recognize that it's truly um, an impactful ignition point that if it's not addressed uh, how it should be um, it leads to potential catastrophic um, disaster so yeah I'm in favor of keeping it. I, I'm a little indifferent on where it goes, but uh, it needs to be addressed, in my opinion. OK, anybody else? I'll just add. Um, this one's really challenging for me as well. Um, I totally get both Dave's point and I get um, Alyssa's point. It is one of the few um, ignitions that we deal with in the wildland space that you could actually mitigate, right? We can provide education about not dragging chains. We can provide education about not playing with fire. Um, but you really can't mitigate that, right? I mean, you can't do an action, a hardening action that makes that specific cause reduced. Utilities are different where you can do things, undergrounding and certain other things, where you actually re could reduce by mitigation uh, ignitions. And so power lines are very much uh, a tweener for me. I can go both directions, um, but you know this is a group um, discussion, and I don't see a lot of folks, you know, I think it's just a main of us kind of going back and forth on it. So, um, you know, I'd really like to get other people's input as well. Um, all of these are really valid points. Um, but anybody else that's on the committee have a any Jim, input? Sorry, yeah. I just want to, based on your comments, I hear what you're saying. I mean, is there <laughs> is, it, is it worth maybe, since it is one of those six in one hand, half a dozen in the other uh, decision points, uh, do we want to specify that it's maybe those lines that are more out in the wooies and transmission um, and that distribution lines maybe are a different beast? I don't know. No, no, no. I'm going to I'm gonna stop. <laughs> I'm going to stop here because most of it is trans. Aside from campfire, most of it is trans or is distribution lines. So it's, it is the location. It's the, it's the location in the high fire threat district and the tier three. There's different tiers that we use in the electric side of things and 
and you know their their whole system now we've pushed them so hard to understand their risk and to understanding their exact lines that are their highest risk and to to mitigate in those areas so yes it's definitely the wooey is the, is the issue um it, it, you, we don't care about you know oh, cool. undergrounding a line yeah. in san francisco right as much right, so right, right. uh so that's part of the whole conversation already um and I guess that that's the key point, right? It's not only is it a source to to um, to Chief McDougall's point, like it's it, not only is it a source that we can mitigate again compared to other ones, but it's also one that just when it gets going, it can also be like continuing to feed, right, until you get the line shut off, and it has had this catastrophic impact, perhaps in places that it might not otherwise, like a community may not face as much of a risk but for the presence of that line near it. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that this has been a really interesting and informative discussion. I find Melissa's statements really compelling um, and would prefer to have um, something along the lines of what she's discussing in the document. Um, but I, I do understand the the various perspectives. Dave? I just, I would pose the question that I certainly think under risk factors that identifying the presence or absence of utility infrastructure that has the potential to, for the risk of ignition, I think that's an interesting discussion. But the, the, the second part of the discussion is if the utility ignition issue is resolved, does that exclude the potential for other ignitions that could ignite a fire that could burn across the same landscape? And, and I think the answer to that really depends on what time horizon we're looking at. If we're looking at uh, the short time horizon, then probably. If we're looking at something over the 15, 20, 30 year time horizon, then preventing the utility ignition may just defer the catastrophic event until some other source of ignition causes fire to burn across that same landscape, which at least in California is a regular and recurring feature. Okay. Anybody else? Hmm. Okay. Can I ask? Um, because that we're we're focusing more on the the second part. Um, you know, and I recognize I put two issues together under the same barrier. Uh, the first part about the understanding the locational impact of the mitigation. And, and making sure risk models take that into account. Is there any objection to that as a barrier? So for my first paragraph, not under the recommendations, but under the actual explanation of the barrier itself. Again, I'm not attaching the language of the way it's written, but is there concern about us calling out as a barrier to understanding risk models that we don't fully know yet how to model, if I'm understanding correctly, the impact of of the house on the back on the edge of the community being mitigated versus the one that's in the interior. Or we don't. I, I mean, not. I think Melissa, from my perspective, it's it's really a question of epidemiology. You know, like you, you jump mm -hmm. on the plane and someone's got COVID. And the question is, if you vaccinated 50 percent of the plane, does that or does not prevent spread in the plane? I mean, it's the same kind of contagion issue. And we debate a lot about it, but we've never really had a true analysis in situ where you can say yes has made a difference or it doesn't make a difference we're still sort of conceptually arguing around the effect of one thing versus the other and you know it, it, dave and i have been going back and forth on the mitigations that matter viewpoint like you know if you can i mean the goal is to try and prevent a high density community from getting uh, exposed to wildfire um, and so do you focus on the exterior perimeter of the community because that's the side that you think is going to get the flaming front well, you might, but then you've got this long distance transport of embers piece. And once it gets into the interior core, then everything changes and you move to a structure to structure fire. And if you haven't done all the work, then you have this other more complex arrangement. And so it's kind of a both hand. Um, and I think, you know, we can model it empirically, but I don't know that we'll actually, it'll actually perform in the way we think that it will, given the intersection of wind, localized conditions and, you know, so some are arguing that if you hit a certain threshold that you'll start to prevent, just like we are with COVID, we're starting to prevent spread because we've saturated a certain, you know, created that herd immunity concept. 
And I don't know that we we know that that is how it will play out. And because of the intersection with available crew and resources, it's a highly complex issue to to try and take into all the models. Is it a barrier then? I mean, I like, I appreciate that. I think that's, that brings it up to an even broader level. And is that worth calling out? I, my inclination is that it is, that we don't understand, we don't understand this yet. And so it's hard to fully understand the impact of the mitigations, especially if there is a locational impact or not. I think the barrier is the barrier of achievability and saturation. So like a small outlying community that's maybe high density and has eight homes down one road, but the homes are kind of clustered. You could make a difference with those eight homes. It doesn't, it might not change the overall outcome of a whole community, but it does make an impact at that scale. When you start moving to the scale of thousands of homes and a big subdivision, how many of those homes do you need to have meet this standard? And how many resources do you put into that context of work? So Since no one's doing anything at this point, <laughs> realistically, I mean, I think the strategy is that we all need to just, you know, increase pace and scale. And and there's there's no reason to to significantly wait. And we go after those that are low income and socially disadvantaged, and we put our resources where where we know there are populations that need more assistance. But understanding the spatial interaction piece is beyond where we're at yet in my mind. Uh, Dave? Uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm in violent agreement with Yana and for full disclosure, we spent most of the time we were supposed to be working on, uh, on language agreeing about this issue. Uh, I, would, <laughs> I would say to amplify her point that this additional complexity that we simply do not have models for fire spread in the built environment with structures as the fuel carrying the fire. So when we transition into that point of conflagration, that is exactly what she's talking about, either through long range spotting or through the flaming front and the ground component of fire moving into a community. When it gets beyond, when we have that vegetation to structure and then structure to structure transfer, uh, that's beyond the scope of current models. And so it, it's very, very challenging to quantify the value of the work being done, defensible space home hardening, all of which is designed to spend to prevent vegetation to structure transfer. And since we're now outside of what the models are capable of, I think it's it's particularly challenging to to, to show the benefits of the efficacy of this work beyond saying that we know that homes that have defensible space and are hardened are less likely to burn, as in it's not going to cause any harm to have this work done. And the greatest barrier here is the social adoption piece. Um, in some places resourcing, but in other places simply attraction to the, the current sense of place that the landscaping or the, the home construction features give the residents. And that the work it's going to take to achieve implementation of these things on the ground is going to be over a much longer time scale than the ongoing and evolving work to model it. And suggesting that it would not be advisable to wait until we knew for sure and had the yeah. absolute ability to empirically model the value of this stuff. Absolutely. You don't want to wait for that. <laughs> I think there's somebody else maybe had their hand up. I saw I went down. It, was, it was me. I was just Dory, Dory, okay. I was just I was just agreeing with the points that Yanni and of course Dave just also as well. So um, okay. when he started talking then I took my hand down. So <laughs> I was just agreeing with that. I believe in that. Mm -hmm. So, and, and what is what I'm hearing, I want to make sure I'm hearing it correctly, um, is that this is A, so far beyond what we're able to model at this point, and B, we wouldn't want to send any message that you need to be able to model this before you start doing encouraging mitigations. Is it just not worth even mentioning then because it might send the wrong message that you need to understand this? Okay, so that's, uh, Jan and I, Dory, okay. All right. I think it can be done in the right tone. You know, then honest appraisal that we don't understand the full, it's hard to quantitatively assess one mitigation in one house on one street versus 10 mitigations on 10 houses on one street. But I don't know that we have to be limited by that to move, move into action. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's a really important point to just say somewhere in this paper. 
probably fits right here where we're looking, don't you think, Yana? I mean, it, mm -hmm. this kind of kind of goes that way, but I think it can be added to to your this discussion to um, bring that out. Do you want to take a stab at this one, Yana? That eight point four, that okay. specific one. And how I'm mean, happy to work. How does where are we agreeing on where the utility piece goes? Not sure we have. <laughs> yeah, I don't sure know. We where to talk I about feel like the there just needs to be. I don't know a, that we solved that either. I know. I feel like there just needs to be this utility section of does not fit anywhere else, but needs to be talked about. So um, I have it under the mitigations that matter already. Perhaps. I mean, I I I like from a. The other way to frame some of this kind of stuff that is sort of tangential but important is like the call out box or you know a side box that is somehow separate from the main report but like hey let's think about utilities and you know is maybe a not within the main body but it is an important issue so there's kind of other ways from a formatting perspective to to anchor something yeah well i think we all we all see all different sides of it so i think you're Point, Yana, somewhere we can fit it. Um, you know, it's it's definitely something the group feels is important, but where we fit, we can't seem to figure out. And then it's kind of this tweener between an ignition and a mitigation, and it's kind of it's got both. Yeah, it's both, it's, it's it's both it's, an ignition source and a mitigation, and for communities, and that's what makes it hard. Yeah, and I think I don't, at least for me, I, I would never argue that if you did home hardening and really strong defensible space and community develop, you're better off hardening and undergrounding. The, in, the utility infrastructure is going to give you more benefit. But then I go, well, why would you do that? Well, it's to reduce the possibility of ignition, and then you get back to the ignition. So it, it's it's really, for me, like I said, it's a, it's a real tweener, and I think you got to do it when you're doing community hardening. You need to make sure the utility infrastructure is hardened. So that's where I get hung up because I think it's a super important component to community hardening, right? So, uh, Dave? I just, uh, I, I, at the risk of belaboring the point, I, yeah. I think it, it would be helpful, at least from my perspective, if if the work in this space was, was had a header of something along around ignition reduction or something like that that clearly called it out as different from the mitigations we were talking about, which are agnostic of the source of the fire and all the other settings. And for me, at least, that comes from a very firm belief in I, I've hit the I believe button that and, and I, I would open for any pushback if anyone disagrees with me, but California is not going to have a fire free future in any scenario. No. And so if we if we accept that fire is a regular and recurring feature of the landscape and regardless of what we do, it will continue to occur, then I would be much more comfortable calling out ignition reduction utility efforts in that space. And with all the caveats that were previously offered about the utility ignitions are particularly pernicious due to their timing and the, the length and the total flux released. That that to me feels like an important caveat so that it doesn't get lumped in with something that I think could be really dangerous, which is suggesting to folks that there, there's an easy button here of, oh, if we just eliminate utility ignitions, there won't be a wildfire problem in California anymore. Right. Right. Very much agree with that. But we might be able to control when we have ignitions during the weather conditions we want. Uh, I, I, I would not be comfortable with that statement. <laughs> That's my aspiration. It helps. Yeah, it helps. Okay. Um, well, and we could, you know, I don't know if it's additional barrier. We could always add it maybe in here. We have some at the very bottom, 8.4. Um, you know, we have some things here that are um, to the point where we could add um, maybe ignition management type of a statement, right? Or just and make it pretty small. Um, I don't know, thoughts? I'm just trying, I'm like Dave, I'm, I think if we're going to add it because it is that tweener, maybe it does deserve its own little place in barriers. Maybe one of the ways to talk about this is that, you know, we are now getting um, spatially correct data around fuel reduction and defensible space compliance. And so for the first time, uh, we're going to have, you know, like the Oak Fire, 
we had 168 homes that were uh, evaluated with defensible space inspections prior to the exposure of them to, to fire. We, we finally are developing a baseline data set to know where the starting point is for a number of homes respective to typical mitigations that we're talking about. So maybe we frame it around building that comprehensive data set as through DSI inspections gives us, you know, the ability to start to look at this stuff and look at long-term trends. That that's that that kind of investment is is warranted, and we've got lots of other private firms that are uh, collecting data for communities um, or storing data for communities, respective to grant programs, and that all will help us understand how mitigations perform in well future wildfire exposures. Okay. All right. Well, Melissa, Dave will reach out to you. He texts me. He's iffy on his meeting, but um, and we'll work on figuring that out. Um, yeah, good maybe. discussion around this, though. I think we, it's, a, it's a really good point. We haven't really dug deep down into. <laughs> yeah, I think we helped daylight why this is causing so much consternation because it's complex. Yeah. It's, it's complex, and it's for me, it's that cleaner. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so the only piece in, um, we got about 20 minutes, um, excuse me, 10 minutes left on the call. I didn't see any comments um, in the document, but we added the conclusion back in that got left out inadvertently. Um, so that's been batted back in, but I didn't see any additional comments to it. But again, we want to make sure once we get these things cleaned up that we review that based against the executive summary, right, Yana? We want to make sure we got it all everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so with the essence the, of, go ahead. The, oh, the overall consensus is that Yana and Melissa are going to work on writing this section. It could possibly be a call out box or it co could possibly be its own subsection, but it's in the right section. Just to make sure I followed everyone's. Dave, uh, sorry, Dave recommendations. Reach out to Melissa. I'm sure he's been talking to you on a working on it, so I'm sure that's probably about the case. Yeah, I mean, I think there's two issues, and there's the, the, the first part Yana is going to help with in, in this in this section. Um, the second part, it's still TVD, I think, where this utility stuff goes. And yeah. perhaps Dave and I and maybe Yana will join in too. Um yeah. just to note, I I my last day is next Friday. So um I had Hope to be around for the end of this paper, but um, need to have any conversations before then. We're trying. I know. <laughs> okay, Yana looks like she has time. So, Dave, when you get in your schedule. So, okay. Um, said so we have a few minutes left. Um, Yana, I don't know if we want to jump back up to the top and maybe try to, you had one big one there, whether you think the paragraph could go because you kind of reworded it. Um, what are your thoughts? I see your hand up. Well, the one thought, so I worked on the intro and I, huh? I'm, I don't know that everybody's got a chance to look at it. And I just tried to look at it with fresh eyes and, and I see it, it's kind of, the conclusion is sort of a, a rehash of some of the main points that are in the executive summary. And I think themat or topically, something that would be good for all of us is if you look at that first sentence, combining key elements of above recommendations, we envision an integrated framework designed to measure communicate. And I I threw some comments to the group like, is it a framework? Is it a program? Who manages it? What is it exactly? A framework is not a con a framework is conceptual. It, it it's a it's a it's a soft word for not being clear with exactly what we're suggesting. And maybe that's as far as we can go, but I thought it could be a, a conversation point for the whole group to say what we what do we really mean here? Looking for hands. Was it just grinning? I don't know. <laughs> Can you? I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around what you're asking. Can you restate that? Okay, so typically when you write a report and you do an analysis, you suggest that here's the issue and here's the way to solve it. 
And to me, a framework isn't a solution. A framework is a way to think about things. It's not actually a, it's a, not a proposed program. It's not, it, it doesn't really elicit action to me. It's a, it feels very much like a, an incomplete thought. That may be as far as we're able to get agreement, and, and I could live with that if that's true, but I just wanted to highlight the word choice we have here and, and make sure that that is the best we can do. And if not, so, maybe try and refine it. Yeah, okay, so I think I get a little bit more about where you're going with it. Um, I guess I've kind of looked at it as, um, I, I agree with you, it's not solution-based, but but I have, kind of thought of it, of it more of like, here's all your options. Here's, you know, what these things can and can't do for you. And then, you know, now you have all the information. So where do you want to take that kind of a thing? Is that, is that on the right track, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think if we turn it in with framework, then immediately someone is going to call Jim and say, what do you mean? So what's the, so what, what are you asking? And, um, I don't know, Jim, if you'd like some help in, in trying to define what the what the recommendation is from us. Well, I honestly don't care much about that because Jim's the one that has to answer it. Not oh, me. thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get, I get, yeah, I get what you're saying in that. I'm, I'm unfortunately, I'm not sure what the solution is. So I, I, I went back and I'm reading the goals and objectives while this is going on. Um, it says uh, to make this group is to make recommendations how to understand, right? So maybe we just reword that because this is a recommendation. I mean, what do you think? I don't know what a framework is. Let me no, just but say I mean, we take the word framework out. Framework to me is like you just said, framework is the framework we built to write the document, right? So it's not a framework. It's a what, right? Is it an Just, approach? An approach? <laughs> I don't know. Well, right. we could darn sure to put approach there. We we an integrated approach. It's true. Because I I get I agree with you, Yana. Framework is like how to solve a you know it's beginning of a process a problem solving process. Uh, but we've designed an approach here that decision makers could look at to to rely on and and troubleshoot as they create new rules and laws and mm -hmm. strategies for us to mitigate uh, and and you know minimize risk i think that's probably a really good word i could throw that i so and the intro are we proposing a program a policy a specific action or is it an approach <laughs> And, and I think it's a recommendation, so it's an approach, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hate words. Melissa. No, I think that's key because, I mean, one, you know, one recommendation you could make out of this is that the state should take on building a risk model and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, Nancy and I had a whole conversation about why that might not be advisable. Um but, uh, you know, I, I, I think that's we have to be clear, like, are, are we making a specific recommendation of, of a next course of action? And we all saw the bill that came out that, that, that didn't go anywhere, but that basically was this, right? Was this next mm -hmm. step to have the state build a model? Um, are we going that far to make it some kind of call on what you should do with this information and what the next step should be? Or is it simply, here's the world of what we understand, what you would need to think about in, in order to understand risk. So it's not, I mean, the world in a framework is equally as bad, but, um, you know, just here's here's our, here's what we're presenting of what it would take to understand this risk comprehensively. And what you do next, you know, we're not touching on where you take this from here, we're not touching on. Right, mm -hmm. right, right, okay. I like the word approach, but uh, anyway, All right, we're running out of time quickly. Yanni, do you have one more thing to add? Or well, I okay. I think this I think the statement I like what Melissa just said. I think that opening two sentences needs to be rewritten around like here are key considerations to solving the problem, and and you know and an adaptive framework is required to do that. But here are the elements that need to be incorporated to be able to accurately assess risk and be able to develop 
some set or a single models that are going to be able to track this stuff over time. Because right now it's it's a little loose to me. Okay. I agree. So. All right. Johnny, you have time to work on that. I'm sure putting a lot on you, but I know we're going to work on these words. We're getting real close. I think one good thing as we wrap up here, I think we've solved all the big key items today. We're through those. Um, we'll go through and clean a lot of it up. And then, um, you know, there's just a few outlanding ones that a few of you will work on. And then uh, we will really start now next honing in on just, you know, that word smithing, making sure things are in the conclusion and up in the executive summary. And that those words are, you know, uh, reader adaptability, I will call it, for those that aren't at our level. Um, <laughs> so with that, as Melissa mentioned, she's leaving, so I don't want to not recognize and thank her for all of her efforts on this group. Um, really appreciate it. Um, your uh, additions are very valuable to this project, and uh, we really appreciate all your effort. I know it's one of those things we all do off our table, but thank you very much, and uh, I really appreciate your your time and effort. Thank you. It's been great working with you all. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, real quickly, uh, roundtable. If there's any anybody else has to add. Okay, I will add to that real quick. Celeste, uh, we did send out a new doodle poll. So for those of you who haven't got to it. Um, could you please fill that out so we can get our next couple meetings set and get this thing wrapped up? Um, so please do that. Um, is there any public comment? Okay. Uh, seeing none, again, we don't have the next meeting scheduled yet, so please uh, get to that doodle poll. And with that, I will ask for a motion for adjournment. So moved, Robert. Robert. Seconded, Yana. Second, Yana, Robert, Yana. All those in favor of adjourning, aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, seeing none, motion passes unanimously. Thank you all for your time, and uh, we look forward to meeting with you probably in another week after next, I think is when the first one is, or possibly is, depending on uh, your doodle polling. So uh, thank you all very much, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks.